When I uh, started college, I had a minor in psychology. My major was, was Bible, but I had a minor in psychology. I knew at the time that I wanted to work uh, with people. I was heading towards ministry, and I was told that studying in this field uh, would help me. However, to be honest with you, um, I didn't get a lot out of the experience of those classes. At 18 and 19, the theories and understanding how the human mind works uh, really didn't engage uh, my interest. Um, I knew what I needed to know, and I was good. Now, that isn't to say I didn't learn anything. After all, I had a scholarship to maintain, and so um, I worked hard, and I learned a lot, but I didn't learn a lot, if you know what I'm saying. Now, if you fast forward 10 years after the experience, though, uh, I was in seminary, and I had taken, uh, or actually part of my program was several, several classes in psychology. However, the experience was entirely different. At this point, I was a leader in ministry. I had been married for uh, a few years, and I had um, a wonderful, beautiful baby girl. And all of a sudden, those classes were very interesting and relevant. <laughs> My attitude and level engagement was completely different. Perhaps you can relate. There's a principle that underlines my experience. When I understood the why, I wanted to be there, and it mattered that I was there. When I understood, when I could feel and understand the why, I wanted to be there, and it mattered that I was there. When I was in college, I was in class because supposedly it was good for me. Someone told me that. They told me it was important. But my personal experience at that point didn't really reflect that. Now, 10 years later, I was engaged in several relationships that were important to me. And of course, experience had taught me that relationships with people are complicated. No. I know. No. So the classes that, at that point were not a matter of education, but of survival. <laughs> I wanted to take those classes, and they mattered to me. Well, let me tell you, they matter even more now than they did then. Now, that leads us to the question that I have for us today. Why are we here? Why are we here? Why, and, I'm, and I'm talking about in this room. I'm not talking about the big question. I'm talking about, we'll, just go, we'll start with a smaller one. Why do we gather and do this thing that that we identify as church. Now, for some, it's about um, different things. Might be answering the question, is God real? Many folks come, and they're just like, all right, are you really there? Is this really true? Is there something more? For others, you're here because you want to be part of a community. It's lonely out there. I'm surrounded by people but it's basically go to work, come home, eat, sleep, go to work, come home, eat, sleep, and then um, extra sleep on the weekends. Amen. But you want to be part of a community. For others, you want your life to change or maybe to be more fulfilling, to be happy. You're thinking, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll find there'll be a key here to my happiness. Maybe they'll help me get over something that I've never been able to get over, that's, that's tripping me up. For others, you're here because you want to go to heaven. Something freaked you out. And you're like, you know, it won't hurt. I want to be able to pass the entrance exam. So you're here. For others of you, you're at the place maybe where you say, I want to grow in my faith. I, I believe this thing. I know this thing, but I'm new in it. And I, and I come so that I can grow. And for many of us, if I asked you this question right now on the spot, your answer would be, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And the, the truth is, that's probably many of us. Now, if you aren't clear, though, on the why of being here, you probably won't get as much as you could out of this experience, out of the gathering. In answering the why question, 
you may be surprised at how I would answer this question. I would say that we are here to become dusty disciples of Jesus. Now, obviously, this is going to take some explaining. It's probably, probably not what you were thinking that I would say. So let me explain by taking you to Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, at least to start. Very familiar passage, probably, if you grew up in church uh, at all. If not, uh, an interesting passage. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee. Preparing their nets, Jesus called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Now, it's easy just to read by this passage and go, it's Jesus, and it's... But they haven't really had a whole lot. They've had some exposure to Jesus at this point, but not a whole lot of exposure at this point. And the question I ask myself is, why would these men drop their nets, leave their father... At, at, I mean, really, just at a moment's notice, and follow Jesus. Now, in my studies, I found that the answer to this question starts with a rare invitation that Jewish rabbis of this time would make in the first century. It all began, actually, with those words, follow me. In the first century Jewish life, um, these two words, follow me, carry the power, actually, to transform a life. It was these two words that every Jewish boy in the first century, it's a different time, dreamed of hearing. From their earliest schooling, their earliest schooling was known as Beth Sefer. Beth Sefer. Uh, in this, the main textbook the kids would go to was the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They would learn these. And they were told if they worked hard, and became the best of the best, they may one day become a Talmud. Talmud. Now this is the Hebrew word for disciple. Talmud is the Hebrew word for disciple. Now, like I said, most kids at this time were in Beth Sefer, but only a few would be selected to go to the next step. Most would not continue their education beyond the age of 12. Instead, the girls would go home and learn to manage a household, and the boys would apply themselves full-time to learning and practicing the family trade. The fortunate few, though, the exceptional students, or those with a little extra money, um, had the chance to continue on to the second level of education, and this was known as Beth Midrash. Beth Midrash. Here, the local rabbi would lead them in studying the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures, that's Joshua through Malachi. And they would learn from their local rabbi as he would lead them in studying. But even after this schooling, most of the students then, after Beth Mithrash, would eventually go and apply themselves full-time to learning and practicing the family trade. However, the best of the best, the really, 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 really good ones, they um, would go to a rabbi that they admired, and they would ask to be allowed to follow him. Now, the rabbi then would qualify the student by testing the student's knowledge of the scriptures. He would test their ability to follow the rabbi's instructions. And perhaps, if he didn't know the student that well, he'd have the student follow him around for a short period of time to get to know his character most of these applicants, though, would not make the cut. The rabbi would give them some kind words about their skill and their commitment to the scriptures, and then he would gracefully suggest that they continue in the family tray. However, for a select few, their childhood dream would come true. The rabbi would give them an invitation, and he would simply say, Follow me. 
follow me. By inviting the young man to follow him, the rabbi would be offering him the opportunity to become a Talmud, a disciple. By using these two words, the rabbi would be giving the biggest vote of confidence and the greatest invitation a young Jewish man would have ever wanted to hear. See, if a rabbi invited you to become one of his Talmud, one of his disciples, he was saying, I believe in you. I believe in you. He believed that you had the capacity to know what he knew. What he knew. To think like he thought and to feel like he felt. In short, he believed you could be like him in thought, understanding, word, deed, will, and character. Becoming someone's disciple encompassed more than just learning and memorizing information. It encompassed their whole being. Now, in, in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 40, uh, Jesus is saying, be careful who you choose to lead. And then he gives this Jewish principle, which they all would agree with. This is according to the complete Jewish Bible translation. I want you to hear it from the Jewish perspective. A Talmud, what we call a disciple, is not above his rabbi, but each one, when he is fully trained, will be like his rabbi. See, this was Jesus' understanding of what it meant to be a disciple. Now, the word like in this verse is the Greek word hus. This word reflects the quality of a person, a thing or an action, as to be the equivalent or exactly like it. In other words, Jesus defines the goal of being a disciple as someone who will be exactly like their teacher. Jesus is not looking for a bunch of people who have simply learned his teachings by heart. He's looking for disciples for Talmud who desire more than anything to become imitators of him, actually transformed like him in a way that he thought, in the way that he understood God, to, trans, to be transformed like him in word and deed, and most of all, whose very will and character were transformed like him. That's quite an invitation. So, of course, these guys are out on their boat fishing. You know what that means? They weren't the best of the best. They are practicing the family trade. They flunked out. No scholarship. They're the B team at best. And so when Jesus comes along, a rabbi, and, and a rabbi, by the way, they do know about. He's, he's got a growing reputation. And he looks out at them, and he gives them the rabbi invitation. Follow me. You think their father said, oh, no, 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 don't leave. <laughs> no. no. This was better for, for a Jewish family than if, than if he got invited to medical school. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was the premier invitation. So, of course, they left their nets. They left their trade, and they followed him. Now, here's, here's a kind of interesting thought that kind of hopefully will begin to tie this together for you. An indicator of a good disciple in Jesus' day was that they were really dirty. I know it seems weird. But travel was dusty and, of course, dirty. And at day's end, a disciple would be covered with the dust of those in front of them, the lead person being the rabbi. They would be covered with the dust of the rabbi. And that is why a saying arose, may you be covered in the dust of your master. So if you've been coming a while and we've been ending with go walk in the dust of the master, hopefully a light bulb will go on. Oh, that's what he's been talking about. May you be covered in the dust of your master. This saying arose um, as really a blessing more than a statement. It was the high, highest mark of a disciple that you would walk so closely behind your teacher that you were caked with the dust that he kicked up. You were a dusty disciple. And the dustier you were, the better disciple you were. If you just think of the order of following, the closer you are to your disciple, the more dust you get. If you're in the back of the pack, the other disciples in front of you, you're not as dirty. 
So the dirtier you are, the better. And there was kids here, they would say, yeah, mom. <laughs> now, there may be many things that we are hoping for will come out of this thing that we call church. But for me, for us as a church, one of the highest ideals is that we become dusty disciples. So I want to pause and I want to look at what it means. I want to look at the dust of Jesus. What does it mean to be dirty? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What did he expect of his disciples? Now, the key to this answer lies in Jesus' statement, what we just read in Matthew 4, 10, his invitation, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And if we look closely at this statement, there are three parts to it. Three parts. The first is the invitation. There is an invitation that you need to respond to. Follow me. Follow me. Notice he doesn't just say, believe in me. He just doesn't say, read my book. He doesn't say, go to my church. He says, follow me. And of course, if you understand discipleship in this day, which I just explained, this is more than just be, be, be a student. It's an invitation for transformation. What he's saying is this. You have your fisherman's life. You have your fishermen's or, or your tax collectors or your political activism view of life. I want you to trade that for my worldview. I want you to trade that identity for the identity I'm going to give you. You need to understand if you respond to my invitation, that is what you're responding to. This isn't an invitation to come hang out and just learn a few good things. It's an invitation that you must choose. And, you're, and you must drop your nets. You must leave your, your, your money collecting, in Matthew's case, and follow me. Becoming like the master. Follow me me. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus if you don't choose to follow. You are not a follower of Jesus if you just simply believe in Jesus. The enemy, the spiritual enemy, believes in Jesus. They're not followers of Jesus. You must respond to the invitation. Now, before you get too uncomfortable in your seat, <laughs> yeah, there's also, the second part of this is there's the process. There's the invitation, and then there's the process. He says, follow me, and then he says, and I will make you. I will make you. And this is hugely important because the call that Jesus gives us is overwhelming. And if you look at the end result, you're ready to quit up front. As a matter of fact, we actually see this. So this is what happens. He, he goes down the coast. He invites them to follow him. And so they decide, hey, wow, great invitation. We'll follow him. And as they're following him, Jesus begins to teach the crowds. Get, they get to be too many. So he has Peter in his boat. He says, hey, Peter, let's, you know, let's use your boat. And he goes out a little bit in the water so he's not too crowded. And people, all the people can see him. And he teaches them. When he's done... He says, hey, Peter, let's go out to deeper waters and fish. And Peter goes, I'm, I'm summarizing here. It's good that I'm following you as the rabbi, uh, but I ain't going to follow you as a fisherman because it's hot. We fished all night when it was the prime fishing time. We ain't catching anything. But you are the master, so we'll go ahead and do it. And they do. And they catch not only do they catch fish, they catch a miraculous load of fish. Overwhelming. And it's evident that their catch has nothing to do with where they fished, time of day. It has to do with the power and character and identity of Jesus. Now, I want you to remember, when Jesus called them, 
He was not just saying, follow me like a student. He was saying, you are going to become like me. Now, all of a sudden, Peter and the disciples are faced with, we got to be like this. Now, I want to pick up this passage. You can read the context in Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 4. Um, I'm sorry, starting in uh, verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, what I just described to you, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Now I want you to see what happens here. When it's just this great rabbi who says, Follow me, it's like, Hey, I'm in. That's great. A, a rabbi finally al allowed me to follow him. But then he sees where the rabbi's at. And you know what he says to Jesus? You got the wrong person. You don't have to raise your hand, but anyone identify? So you didn't have to raise your hand. You got the wrong man. Jesus, just so the record's clear, I'm a sinner. Now, that was a kind of a guarantee for everyone. But, but what Peter says is, is like, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You chose the wrong guy. It is my nature. I can't do what you're calling me to do, Jesus. You got the wrong person. And then Jesus, Jesus responds here. And he says, um, Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. What's he afraid of? Failure. Letting Jesus down. Letting himself down. Letting his family down. Letting the kingdom of God down. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. See, when Jesus' response to Peter was, you ain't telling me anything I don't already know. But like when I said, when I said follow me, you notice I didn't say follow me and work really hard. He said, follow me and I will make you. See, the process is what Jesus, what the master does in us, not what we do for ourselves. We talked about this, right, when we went through the, the 12 steps and we looked at that. For those who are powerless, the key step is not to quit drinking, drugs, whatever the, the addiction is. The key the key to recovery is, I can't, but you can. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. That's the process. The process is, is I will make you. And then that leads to the last part, the outcome. The outcome. He says, I'm going to do something specific. I'm going to do something in you, and this is what's going to be the result at the end. You will be a fisher of men. That's the outcome of a disciple. And, and notice he tells all the disciples this up front. Along with the invitation, along with the process, he says, here is the outcome. This is my goal for your life. You are going to be a fisher of men. He doesn't say my goal, you're going to really understand the Bible. He doesn't say, my, my goal is to get you in church. He doesn't say, my, my goal is to make sure that your life is happy and satisfying and prosperous. He says, this is my goal for you. As you follow me and I begin to transform you, you know how you know your life is changing because you responded to follow me. You know how you know the process that I'm doing in you is working. You become a fisher of men. That is the outcome. Now, some of you have been around a while and, and you're like, oh, I recognize this. We've talked about this in a different form, right? And, and when we summarize what we're about, we talk about that we're here to love Jesus, to live Jesus, to give Jesus. And we've, we've shared this picture behind me, right? The red is, is love Jesus. That is to follow him. The green is to, is to live Jesus. That's to be transformed by Jesus. The blue is to give Jesus. That's to be a fisher of men. And so I've got a kind of another layer for you. 
This is, in fact, our DNA. Those are your blanks in your notes there. This is our DNA. So, as every good pastor, I came up with a little good acronym for you. Here it is. D is decide to follow Jesus. It's the invitation. You will not follow if you do not love him. And that's the key. This isn't, see, this is where we mess up, I think, as a church sometimes. We've unintentionally communicated, and there's people maybe who have intentionally communicated. Here's the central issue. Follow Jesus or die. Follow Jesus or go to hell. And I don't know about you, but scare tactics always work for a season. They work for a season. But eventually, if, if the consequence doesn't come right away, I forget. Or I just don't care anymore. I live for the day. But Jesus calls us to something fundamental when he invites us to follow him. It's follow me because you love me. And, and that lasts a lot longer. That can last a lifetime. It's the right kind of love. So decide to follow Jesus. That, that's what it means to love him. To live Jesus is, is really to develop a new creation identity. And, and remembering that, it, that this identity comes from his work in you. He already sees you as that. Note what he sees Peter, he already sees Peter where Peter's going to be years later when he will no longer deny the Lord and he will actually go to his death uh, because he loves Jesus so much. But when he approaches Peter, all Peter can see is, I'm the sinner. Jesus already has established the new creation identity for Peter. He sees it. He knows it. It's just a matter of Peter allowing him to take him to that place. And that's the same thing for you and I. New creation identity. And the A is act like a minister of the gospel. You are ministers. You are ministers. You're the minister at Apple. You're the minister at your school. You're the minister in your neighborhood. You might be the minister right now on the unemployment line. But wherever you are, you are a minister. A minister of the gospel. So when Jesus invites you and I to follow him, we, we agree, we uh, 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 understand that the contract is that this DNA becomes our DNA. That we decide to follow him. He develops in us a new creation identity and then we act like a minister of the gospel. Not perfectly. It never happens perfectly. But in where people can see, where God can see, progress, right? Progress, not perfection. So the issue for you and me today, I believe, at this moment in time, is are we going to become dusty? Are you going to become dusty? Jesus is looking for Talmud disciples, even today who desire more than anything to become like him, to love the Father like him, to lay your life down like him, to love the world like him. He's looking for disciples that are open to transformation, and that's important. Not disciples who can do transformation. Matter of fact, um, the, the, when he writes out his candidate list, he, he writes out from most likely to be able to do it to least likely, and then he turns the list upside down. So, that doesn't say a whole lot for the people in this room, does it? We were at the bottom of the list. But that's what, that's what Je Jesus loves. I mean, and and, and the, the reason he likes to work with those kinds of folks is because we're the ones who come to him and go, I got nothing to bring. You got to do it. You're already close to where he wants you to be. Because those who think they can do it, they got to go through a huge process. This happened to Peter, if you remember. Of, of, he's gotta, before he can really work with them, he's got to go through the process to say, you can't. In the recovery program, they call, they call that hitting your bottom. Hitting your bottom is when you finally go, I give up. I'll do whatever because I just can't do it myself. And when you're at that point, you're a good candidate to become dusty, to imitate or really be transformed by Jesus in the way that you think and understand God and in, in, in the way you speak, in the way you act, in your very character. So you no longer have to um, try to be loving. He's transforming you and you are loving. 
We all experience the, the natural stuff. And there's, there's certain people, maybe you have a, a child or a, or a, um, a family member or, or a good friend that you, you just, you don't have to try to love. And then there's others, right? You kind of grit your teeth, you smile. They're, they may be paying you. They may be a customer. They may be whatever. And you just, you're just, but Jesus can actually transform you so that you feel, you actually feel the love for that person the way you do the folks that you naturally feel love for. That is true transformation. That is what it means to become dusty. So here we are in a series, Dusty Discipleship. The DNA of Trinity Church. Now there's a lot more to this. And in the, in the coming weeks, we're going to unpack each of those things. What does it mean to follow Jesus, to decide to follow Jesus? What does it mean uh, for him to develop a new creation identity? What does it mean to act like a minister of gospel? And you'll be happy to know each one's a process. Each one is a process. And we're going to walk through that. And we're, we're going to unpack the why of our DNA. And hopefully as we, as we come out of the other side, uh, a light bulb will go on and your time in here will be different because you'll understand a little bit more of the why. And maybe God will be beginning to stir something in you, a new vision, a new reason to come in and sing. Not just because that's what churches do, but, but to, to come in and just lay your heart and say, thank you for what you did. I'm responding out of love for what you did. And a new reason to hear a message and not just say, is it relevant to my life? Is he going to give me a, a, a way that I can figure out my life so that it works? And, and you'll listen to serving opportunities different because it's not just a matter of, well, that's what the church does. You know, we're good people and, you know, we have to make Jesus look good. But, but it'll, it'll be about God transforming your heart. You'll want to lay down your life for other people. And, and for those of you who have uh, been around, these, these four weeks um, um, are, are kind of discovery for us. It's, this is what it means to be part of Trinity Church. And so I would just say, if you're new or you've been around and you wanted to kind of, or been thinking about joining the church, I guess you could say. For us, membership isn't like, here's a list of, of benefits you get, right? We give the name tags out for free. So after that, it's all gravy. yeah, it's all gravy. For us, um, it's really about saying, you know what? I want that DNA in my life. And I want to join like-minded followers of Jesus who are working on and are in process of that DNA. And that's where you find yourself four weeks from now as you kind of go through this series. We'll have a special uh, luncheon after the second service on October 4th have the opportunity to kind of uh, give questions and then move forward maybe in joining the family here at Trinity Church. So, last little thought here. If you're, if you're new to the church, if you've been here a while, I want to just be clear. Our mission, our mission as a church is to make disciples that have this DNA. That is our mission. That is why we are here. We are here. We are here to make disciples, to invite people, to train people, to pray with people that God does in them when they cannot do themselves, to have this DNA. People who love God and they decide to follow Jesus. People who live Jesus um, because there's a new creation identity forming in them. People who give Jesus, um, not as a program, but because they act like ministers of the gospel. Because as, as your new identity develops, you, you understand, I am a minister. They may not pay me for it. I may not have gone to school for it. But when Jesus, when I responded to the call that Jesus has followed me, that was what he was calling me to, to be a minister of the gospel. That is the why we are here. Now, one of the ways that you and I can respond to this is, and we've been talking about this, um, is to get involved in a new kind of community group, new kind of life group, new kind of small group. And explain that a little bit, I'd like you to watch uh, this video.
Hey guys, Eric Keener here. I'm on pastoral staff here at Trinity Church. And today we're going to be going back in time for a brief history lesson. So, starting back before World War II, pilots were in a race to figure out how to break the sound barrier and achieve supersonic speed. This means that while flying in a horizontal line, they needed to exceed 760 miles per hour. That's over 1,100 feet per second. The issue here was that the planes they were using had propellers, rounded wing edges, and wing flaps that seriously could not even steer while going that fast. This was an issue because when pilots tried to go fast, they'd crash and die. The propeller itself would reach supersonic speeds, but that would cause a disruptive shock wave, some turbulence, and even engine chatter. Well, the design of the plane itself basically couldn't perform at high speeds. It wasn't until the early 1940s that things started to change for the quicker. It took some really smart guys and some really crazy pilots to do a redesign of the plane. They removed the propeller and replaced it with a cone. Then they strapped a giant jet engine to the back. They also had to make the wing angles a lot sharper and they made a few other changes as well. What this allowed them to do was not just meet the speed of sound, but they broke it into pieces with speeds over a thousand miles per hour. The race to reach supersonic speeds wasn't dependent on the pilot's ability to fly, it was on the vehicle design that they were flying. In fact, there were a lot of zealous guys who sadly died trying to fly this fast before the prop plane was redesigned. This lesson from history shows that sometimes it takes a different vehicle to produce the results you're looking for. Here at Trinity Church of Sunnyvale, we are excited to announce our new small group experience. We're calling it Replicating the Discipleship DNA. So we're going to be taking a step beyond the typical Bible study vehicle, which is more focused on gathering information, and we want to move towards actually imitating that information. So if you will, we're going to be training and practicing together with the goal being that everyone is equipped to go out and do the simple basics of sharing the gospel, sharing a testimony, knowing God's story, um, and a lot of things like that. But instead of me telling you about it, I've actually got a few friends that have been journeying with us uh, for a while now, and we'll let you hear their experiences with it. So when it comes to training and imitation, it reminds me of a trip that Trinity did to Haiti to go visit the mom premieres. We ended up doing a VBS camp for the kids and played a game that's kind of like Simon Says, where hey, if we do this, then you kids got to do this. And it was so much fun seeing the kids get it. Just last week, really cool story. So one of the mentors up in the discipleship house in San Francisco, he is teaching one of the guys he's discipling on how to share his faith, how to share the gospel, and easy points on just, hey, this is a simple way to share your testimony. Just remember these things. And so they practice it, he got it, and what did he do? Did he go to bed? No, he actually hit the street that night, walked down Third Street, which is in the hood, of San Francisco, dangerous place, and then he ended up just striking up a conversation with a guy. The guy ended up being Muslim, and with no tactfulness, with all boldness, and just, man, no political correctness, he's just like, man, like, that's not the way that leads to life, and Jesus is the only way, and it's not about Allah, it's not about Muhammad, but Jesus, 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 and I'm just like, oh man, a fight's gonna break out, but then guess what happened? The next day, this Muslim guy ended up coming over to the discipleship house, and he just shared on how, man, when you told me that, I just couldn't stop crying. Like, can you please tell me more about your Jesus? And then he asked if he could actually move into the discipleship house. And so he moved in that day. And I'm just like, whoa, like, are you kidding me? Like, how cool is it to be around like-minded people who are about the gospel and just living out their faith? And it's just such a blessing to be a part of just other Christians being the body. And this is what it's all about, just making God's name famous out there. And so I encourage you guys to, man, church, let's step it up and let's actually live out our faith. So what I really enjoyed about this training was just the hands-on approach we took and it actually trained me to be comfortable with doing things like sharing the gospel and training people up to follow Christ. So what I liked is that we had learned something and then immediately practice it to the point where we were comfortable with doing it with someone else. And then we got to put it in practice throughout the week and have accountability in doing so. So I'm going back to Cal Poly in two days 
and I'm really excited to just take what I learned and go and use it. So there's plenty of, lo of lost people on campus and I'm just excited to go share the gospel and then when they come to Christ, I'll actually know what to train them in and give them tools that they can go and teach other people as they mature in Christ. And so as I go into this, you know, I, I'm just a lot more confident and a lot more comfortable because I know how easy it can be. So for many of us, even who grew up in church, this may be a different uh, experience. I would, I would kind of mention one thing, um, and that is, What, what we're not attempting to do is to give you one way to do ministry and to go out. What we're trying to do is to train you and give you tools so that, that when God gives you opportunities in your context, within your personality, you'll have practiced something that you can share. That's yours. Not something, you know, your response doesn't have to be, you should come to church. Your, your response is because the, the DNA isn't just here, the DNA is in you. You, you can actually share that with them, with where you're at. And, 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 and it does take the body. So there are, there are other steps, there are other opportunities where, where uh, you know, you may, God, use that initial relationship to engage in a church or to engage in a small group or to engage something else. But at least you have the confidence, the initial steps, that you don't have to rely on somebody else because God's doing the work in you. So this, this group start this week. They actually, the first group starts Wednesday at 10 a.m. There's uh, groups Wednesday at 7 p.m. There's a group uh, at Wednesday at, uh, or Thursday at 10 a.m., and that's actually at someone's home. And there's another one um, on Thursday evening at 7 p.m., and then during the 9 a.m. service, during the service, and then if you come next week, Sunday works best out, there are groups at 11 a.m. that you can take. You go to service, and then you go to 11 a.m. The signups are right here along the wall. They're also online. I would encourage you, though, to sign up uh, today. And, um, and if you're a little nervous, that's fine. Peter would say, welcome to the club. Just remember, it's Jesus' work in you, not your work. And so we're going to take a, uh, we're going to pause right here and take, not really pause, but kind of shift gears and take an offering. But let me just uh, say, if you're new or a visitor here, um, this isn't a tipping church. We're not expecting you to tip us. Um, if we can serve you some way, put that on the card and put that in. Otherwise, if you came prepared to give, do so. If not, don't worry about it. Let me pray. Uh, ask God to bless this offering. Father, I thank you. Um, I thank you that not only do you call us into yourself, but you do the hefty living, lifting, and that you meet us right where we're at, but at the same time, you promise not to leave us there if we'll just trust you. And so, God, we want to step out right now and trust, whether it's a prayer request or uh, uh, asking for help, dear Father, or, or tithes and offerings, dear God, whatever it may be, we want to trust you with that right now and ask that you do something miraculous with that. You take that little step of faith, dear Father, and whether it's helping others or finding help ourselves, um, that you may do that unique work that only you can do. May our lives, dear God, be an offering. May, may we lay our lives down as you did first for us to experience your abundance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.